Welcome to Raving Ryan. I'm your host, Ryan Anastasio. Today, I have a very special guest, former chief of the Financial Fraud and Public Corruption U Unit in the U.S. Attorney's Office, and he's also exploring a run for governor of Connecticut, Chris Maddy. Mr. Maddy, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Ryan. How are you? I'm doing well. Good. You grew up in Windsor, Connecticut, and then went on to Georgetown University and then UConn Law School. I understand you also worked at, as a high school teacher on the Navajo Reservation in Arizona. Uh, can you tell us a little more about your life and career? Yeah, uh, so I grew up in Windsor, as you mentioned, yeah. um, and when I graduated from college, I thought I was going to be a teacher. Um, yeah. You know, that's what I thought my career would be, and so I went out to Arizona uh, to teach high school English on the Navajo Reservation, yeah. and uh, as you might imagine, you know, there was a very impoverished part of the country yeah. um, with children coming to school with all sorts yeah. of challenges relating to poverty. Um, and illiteracy and, yeah. um, you know, many of the uh, things that folks who are living in poverty, particularly intergenerational poverty, have to deal with. And so I became very interested in uh, social and economic justice, and then yeah. I went to work for a labor union after that and ultimately law school. I'm now married, uh, yeah. and I have three children, and we live in Hartford. Yeah. And in 2014, you served on the prosecution team that sent former Connecticut Governor John Rowland to prison for the second time. Um, can you tell us a little more about the trial and your role on the prosecution team? Sure. Um, you know, any time uh, mm -hmm. that we brought a case uh, at the U.S. Attorney's Office, it was a team effort. And so I was um, part of a group of people, yeah. including investigators and another federal prosecutor uh, that tried the case. Yeah. Um, Mr. Rowland was charged with campaign finance violations and fraud. Yeah. The allegation was that he and some of his co-conspirators were trying to hide payments that were being made to him from the public by not reporting them to the Federal yeah. Election Commission. So the trial lasted uh, a couple weeks, and yeah. um, it was really kind of a uh, same kind of trial you would expect, uh, yeah. even if it were a defendant who was um, less well-known. Yeah. Uh, but there was a lot of media attention, and we believe strongly in our case, and yeah. um, you know, it was very gratifying to see the jury come back unanimously. and and convict Mr. Rowland for what we thought were very serious offenses against the public. Yeah, and I understand um, Mr. Rowland may be eligible for parole soon. Do you know when that would be? I don't. Um, I, I believe that he's currently incarcerated. I don't know how much yeah. time he has left on his sentence. Yeah, and um, Joe Gannon, who also went to prison for several years on corruption charges, is also considering a run for governor. Um, what do you make of Mayor Gannon considering a run for governor, and do you think he can serve the people of Connecticut successfully as governor? Um, you know, I don't know Mayor Ganim uh, yeah. well personally. I've met him several times. Um, what I would say is that Mr. Ganim was convicted of very, very serious offenses relating yeah. to his public office. I mean, he was convicted of bribery and extortion yeah. and racketeering and perjury yeah. uh, and fraud. And so, you know, my own personal view of it yeah. uh, is that somebody who has shown a willingness to betray the public trust in that way doesn't really belong in your public office. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't say that as a personal criticism of him. Again, I, I don't know him personally, yeah. but you know, part of what I think uh, we will have to decide in this election is on both sides, both Republican and Democrat, uh, is who represents the future for our state uh, rather than the past. Yeah, and some candidates for governor have said that uh, Mr. Gannon should not be able to run, that, that uh, convicted felons should not be able to run for public office. Do you agree with that statement? I don't agree with that. No, I think that um, anybody who is eligible to run yeah. and feels like they have something to offer should run. Um, and so I would never uh, suggest that somebody shouldn't run for office. I'm just yeah. telling you what my personal view is as to um, whether that's the type of candidate that I think is in the, the state's best interest. Yeah. And you're currently in the exploratory phase, which means you're not an official candidate for governor yet. Uh, can you tell us why you're still exploring a run and when do you think you'll officially declare a, for your candidacy for governor of Connecticut? Yeah, you know, I think one of the most important things anybody consider, considering taking on a responsibility yeah. like this should do is listen to people. Um, you know, in some ways, part of the reason we've had such discontent in the public, I think, is yeah. because people don't feel heard. Uh, and so the exploratory phase for us is an opportunity to listen to as many people as we can about yeah. what their concerns are because those should ultimately inform whatever judgments we make about the best policies for the state of Connecticut. So I expect to be in the exploratory phase uh, for some time um, so that I can um, really kind of incorporate as much of the feedback as I get yeah. ultimately into um, whatever platform we decide to put out there. 
Yeah, and like you just said, you've never served in an elected office before, and that really differentiates you from the other candidates. Um, what do you say to people who say that you don't have enough government experience, that you should first seek a lower office? Um, I think it's a legitimate question, and you know, I, what I say is this. Um, I have not spent years in elected office. I've spent yeah. years in public service. You know, I spent eight and a half years at a fairly high level at the Justice yeah. Department. And because of the work I did, I, in some ways I've been able to see under the hood yeah. of government what works, what doesn't work, and why. And not just government, but in, in private markets as well. Uh, and so I, that really, I think, has informed the way I look at government. Yeah. Um, I, but I also think this, you know, um, sometimes I think there is a danger for people who have been um, involved in politics or in an elected office for, for such a long time yeah. that they start to have kind of an insular view of the world. Uh, and so I'm offering people a different experience, which I hope is, is compelling. You know, one of the things that leaders are called upon to do, in fact, the most important thing they're called upon to do is use their best judgment to make decisions under very difficult circumstances. And so, um, you know, that is something I have a lot of experience doing at the Justice Department, making yeah. decisions that affect people's lives, their liberty, um, decisions about what I think is in the best interest of justice. And so, um, you know, that's the kind of mindset I would bring to the job if I were to seek it. Yeah, and if you were to be elected governor, you would be faced with one of the largest deficits to deal with. Um, how would you approach cutting down the deficit and getting the state in a surplus if you were elected as governor? Yeah, so I mean, right now it's hard to know what our budget yeah. will look like in 2018. I mean, yeah. we, we seem to be, I hope, on the verge of getting a deal in place where uh, we will have a balanced budget at least projected yeah. forward for the next two years. Yeah. Um, so it's not clear exactly what the budget situation would be like when the next person enters office. But yeah. I think that the most important priority for uh, both the governor and the legislature is going to be growing the economy so that we create more jobs and yeah. more taxpayers rather than fewer. That's the best long-term and most productive way uh, to get revenue into the state. And so in order to do that, you know, we, we yes, we need to get a handle on our deficit, but we also need to be willing to make strategic investments that really pay off long-term investments in things like transportation and infrastructure and workforce development um, and uh, tech infrastructure as well, uh, along with making sure that uh, our vocational schools and our community yeah. colleges in particular are turning out graduates that are equipped to take the jobs that we actually have here. Uh, that, I think, is the best long-term way to get our uh, budget si situation stable. Yeah, and um, one of the other one of the other Democratic candidates, for Governor Mayor Dan Drew in Middletown, had suggested uh, taxing the rich more in, in order to get out of the deficit. Um, but if you're going if you if you tax the rich, though, um, the uh, problem is that people, uh, the rich rich people in uh, Fairfield County, are moving out and going to New York and other places where maybe they won't be taxed as much. Um, if elected as governor, would you uh, consider raising taxes on the wealthy? You know, so let me start by saying this. Um, we have, we have had two very significant tax increases over the past number of yeah. years. And um, I think a lot of people now feel that uh, they didn't get very much as a result of those tax increases. Yeah. I think people feel like they went to a budget deficit that many folks blame the government for to begin with. And so um, I think it is important as somebody who is seeking public office to recognize that before you propose taxing uh, people, whether they're wealthy or the middle class or the poor or otherwise, that you first have their confidence that their tax dollars are going to be going to something that helps them and going to something that builds a long-term uh, viable economy in Connecticut. So while it may be that sometime over the next number of years we need to consider revenue increases, yeah. we should not do that before we have gained the confidence of the public that their tax dollars are going to be well spent. Yeah, and some uh, candidates uh, on the Republican side have suggested, suggested uh, just eliminating the, the income tax. Do you think that's a possibility? I think that the, that is an outrageously yeah. irresponsible proposal. I mean, we get $9 billion a year, half of our budget yeah. uh, from the income tax. Um, and what I have not heard uh, as part of that proposal is any way to replace any part of that revenue. Yeah. I mean, essentially what we would be doing is gutting our state. Yeah. Uh, so no, I think that um, those types of proposals may be good at getting headlines, um, but yeah. they're not serious. Yeah, well, it has been successful in other states, such as New Hampshire and Florida, where maybe you raise the pro property taxes and sales tax. 
do you think that would be a possibility if we were to re you can move it out, move into other taxes, maybe even add in, add tolls in? Well, understand this: that for states that do not have a tradition of an income tax, they have found ways yeah. to generate revenue in other ways. So, for example, Florida. Florida is a global tourist destination, yeah. right? So they get revenue every year from a year-round tourism industry. Yeah. We don't have that. Yeah. Um, Florida, by the way, uh, doesn't have a very good education system. Yeah. We have great schools here. You go to one of them, yeah. Amity High School, right? Yeah. Um, New Hampshire. Now, New Hampshire uh, is a low-tax state, but New, ha New Hampshire is also a state that doesn't have uh, nearly the kind of needs that some of our communities in Connecticut have. Yeah, and many businesses have been leaving the state of Connecticut. We saw GE leave last year. Now Aetna is moving its uh, exec executives to New York City. Um, what, do, what are you going to do as governor to keep businesses in Connecticut and try to drive new businesses into the state? Mm -hmm. um, so my assessment of the GE and Aetna departures is that both of those companies uh, are competing very hard for talent. Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, for example, GE is basically transforming itself into a digital company. Yeah. They have a need for young, tech-savvy workers. Um, Aetna, I think, wanted to locate in a place that is considered okay. more hip. Uh, and so what we see is that, you know, young people coming out of college today um, are very interested in the place uh, yeah. that they are settling, in some ways more so than the job itself. And so that requires Connecticut. If we're going to compete for those yeah. uh jobs and workers, and we should, is we should, we do need to invest in our cities in a meaningful yeah. way, right? We need to invest in housing stock there. Um, we need to invest in public transit there. Uh, I think the state should be looking to attract startup businesses to Connecticut that can yeah. locate in our urban centers. And so that means um, making credit and subsidy available to, uh, to new businesses in Connecticut. Those are the types of things I think we can do to grow an ecosystem where companies will want to locate. Yeah, and um, an idea proposed this year uh, was to put tolls on Connecticut's highways. Um, no legislation has been passed yet on it, but uh, a lot of people would say they want to do it there, um, eventually because it could help with the deficit. Um, if you were to be governor, would you consider putting tolls in the state? Yes. I, I think that um, tolls, frankly, are long past due in Connecticut. Um, right now, we have technology that allows you to install electronic tolls. Yeah. I don't know when the last time you went on the Mass yeah. Turnpike was, but yeah. um, I was up there, uh, you know, maybe a, a month ago, and I drove right on the yeah. Mass Pike at Sturbridge, no stopping, yeah. no nothing. I got a bill a week later from Governor Charlie Baker saying, thank you, Chris Matty, for giving the Commonwealth of Massachusetts $5.50. Uh, and so I think the question for Connecticut at a time yeah. when we have a serious deficit in our transportation and infrastructure yeah. is how are we going to pay for it? Uh, we have to pay for it. It's not as if we're not going to fix yeah. our roads and bridges. And so the only question is, are we going to get people from New York and New Jersey and Rhode Island and Massachusetts yeah. to help us pay for it? And, and there are ways to do it to minimize the burden on Connecticut residents. So, for example, uh, you know, I, I would be in favor of a tax credit or rebate uh, for Connecticut residents who pay tolls. Uh, I think we would have very, very limited, if any, interior tolling, mainly at the border. Uh, and I also think that um, what we need to consider is making sure that any transportation from toll revenue, yeah. I'm sorry, any uh, revenue from tolls goes towards transportation. And I'd also want to look at reducing the gas tax in coordination with that. So would you put it in a lockbox, the money that you got from tolls to go to use for infrastructure? I think that um, I think that a lockbox is a good idea because it does, you know, force us in the absence of discipline yeah. uh, to invest in infrastructure and transportation in a way that we are desperate for. Yeah. And I want to fin I want to finish up with some personal questions. Um, yeah. Do you have any hobbies? Yeah, I mean, I, my yeah. <laughs> my biggest hobby is taking care of my kids and spending yeah. time with my kids. Um, so I don't really have time for much else between my day job, yeah. uh, my exploratory campaign. Uh, and my children, I really don't have time for much else. If I can squeeze in some exercise here or there, I yeah. will. Uh, I do watch Game of Thrones, yeah. uh, and so, although I wouldn't really consider that a hobby. Uh, so, uh, you know, someday I'll have more time for hobbies, but right now it's yeah. pretty much my kids. And um, I, to finish up with, um, we asked this I asked this question to everybody that I interview. Uh, Kenneke is really well known for its pizza restaurants. Um, do you have a favorite pizza restaurant in the state? Oh, well, I, I, that's a tough one. Uh, I'm a hometown guy, so yeah. I'm going to have to go with my hometown pizza restaurant, uh, Jim's Pizza. 
in Windsor. Uh, but, you know, my family's originally from New Haven. Yeah. And obviously, New Haven is the heart of pizza yeah. in Connecticut. And I got to say, at the risk of alienating some people, I, I am partial to modern pizza right. in New Haven. Um, I love Sally's. I love Pepe's. I like Bar. But if I had to choose, I'd probably go with modern. But I got to give, you know, first place to Jimmy's Pizza in Windsor. Yeah. And Mr. Matty, it was great having you on. Thanks for coming on. Good luck on the campaign trail. Oh, it was a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for watching. You know, if you're on YouTube, you can go to ravingryan.com. Uh, follow me on Twitter and Facebook, and follow uh, Chris. Uh, go to Chris's website, mattyforct.com, right? You got it. Yep. And then, and then follow his pages on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for watching. Reporting for Raving Ryan, I'm Ryan Anastasio.